Welcome to the 1245 session of the 2022 IT Professionals Conference. I'm Amanda Thornton. I am the co-chair of the conference this year. I'm also a software developer at the Space Science Engineering Center in the AOS building. Oh, I'm spotlighted now too. <laughs> um, our speaker today is Robin Fisher and I will have her introduce, oh, am I introducing? I'm introducing yourself. Let me introduce Robin Fisher. Robin received her BS in Life Sciences Communication from UW-Madison. After graduation, she promptly landed a radio station job only to have the journalist, journalism that dream dashed three months later due to the events surrounding 9-11. She bounced around the private sector, soaking up knowledge and skills along the way. Four and a half years ago, she joined the administrative team at the Department of Theater and Drama. She supplements her work by participating in shared governance, advising a service fraternity, and becoming a true tool of all trades. And occasionally dropping in at Leadership Improv. Thank you, Robin. And now I'll turn it over to you. I did have one update I forgot to mention. It's actually been seven and a half years. So, but oh. we're here and I totally forgot that that was in there. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen and we will get started. So don't forget to put in your drinks for the coffee counter. Um, that was up <laughs> right away. And let's see how we can get a grip on our computer. So we're gonna start by talking about operating systems. And before I get started, I wanna mention, if anyone knows what a registry editor is, this course might be a little bit elementary for you. If you don't know what a registry editor is, that's great, you're in the right spot. <laughs> So the easiest way I found to explain operating systems is to use a building analogy um, as if you were building a house. So Mac is kind of like if you were to go to Viridian Homes and get a house built by Viridian. They would give you a few options for size, a few options for color, maybe a couple of design options, but for the most part, you're getting a full package. They choose the furnishings, the electronics, the appliances, but they make sure everything works and fits. So you don't have to worry about anything. It's all put together for you. You just move right in. Whereas Windows, you kind of put things together yourself. So you find a builder, but now it's on you to make sure that the bedroom door will actually be able to fit your bed through the door as you're getting it in. Uh, you have to make sure that the entertainment system you're buying will fit the space that you want it to fit and that the sound will be appropriate and installed correctly. And when you're purchasing your appliances, you have to be responsible for making sure that your um, outlets are going to be able to support them, that if there's any drains or plumbing that you have to worry about, that that's kind of on you. So uh, you get to have more options, but you also have to have it on yourself to kind of uh, make sure everything fits together. Now, Linux is a open source operating system, which means developers around the world have access to the code. And so they're constantly updating, uh, creating new versions, making it kind of their own, but they're sharing their information. And so I compare Linux to an Amish barn raising where the, uh, the, the plans are all shared, the building is all uh, a, a group project, everyone's involved, everyone knows what's going on, and you can all help each other as you go through it. And then we move on to keyboard shortcuts. So this is actually really great that it's virtual because all of you have a keyboard in front of you now. And so you can try some of these things as I'm talking. Um, but we have basically a standard keyboard on the screen. And the first and most important button that I wanna talk about is your Windows key. Now on a standard keyboard, your Windows key is in the bottom left-hand corner typically next to the alt button. Um, you might have a button or two around it, but you'll see a little Windows icon on there. And my favorite use of this key is the first one, which is when you tap the key, it actually brings up a search bar and you can look for any program, see if it's on your computer 
And if it's not on your computer, or even if it is, uh, it'll actually give you an option to search for it online. Um, you can look for documents this way, and it'll search your computer and find the various documents or uh, give you search options as if you were typing this into a web browser. So that's one of my favorite ones. I use it all the time. I typically don't uh, look for app icons anymore. I just hit my Windows key and type in the app that I'm looking for. The next uh, few shortcuts with the Windows key are going to rely on you to do a little bit of finger manipulation. So if anyone could, if everyone could take their left hand and place your thumb over your Windows key and your middle finger over your tab key, that's pretty much how I like to keep my left hand because then I'm gonna be using my left thumb on the Windows key for all these shortcuts and you'll see why the tab key is kind of important in a little bit. So the first really neat keyboard shortcut is to hide or display your desktop. And that's with the Windows key and D for David. So I'm gonna hold down my Windows key and I'm gonna tap the D. And you now see my desktop. Um, you can continue to hold down the Windows key and alternate uh, between hiding and displaying your desktop. Um, and sometimes with some versions of Windows, it might work smoothly and other times, depending on what you have open, it might not. I found that uh, sharing and a PowerPoint presentation in full screen kind of disables some of these features. So you'll, you'll have to play around with it, but it should be fairly easy. And you're just changing the displays, so you're not actually closing out of anything. Now, if you're working on something sensitive and someone comes in and you've got to leave your computer real quick, uh, one quick way to do that is to lock your computer. So if you hold down the Windows key and tap L, I'm not sure if this will still share, but I'm going to try it anyway. And it will log you out. And I'm just getting logged back in here. Not sure if that showed anything, but um, it takes you right out to your lock screen. You're still logged in, but you're locked out of your computer and someone needs to put in your password to access it. So it's really great if you need to leave your computer real quick and you've got sensitive information on there um, and you don't have time to shut things down. So Windows key L. Another favorite of mine is the Windows key M. If you're anything like me, you've got five, six, 10 things open all at once. And sometimes it just gets a little overwhelming or I need to find something a file, um, maybe something on my desktop. And so you can type Windows key M as in Mary and it will minimize your windows. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with PowerPoint slideshow in full screen. So I can't show you that one. And the last one is Windows uh, key and R. And what this does is it brings up a small box called the run box. And with this box, you have to know exactly what your document is called and where it is, or the shortened name for the program that you're looking for, for this to work. So this is a little bit more of an advanced feature, but it can still be useful. So if I type in calc, it'll actually bring up the calculator, um, which can be quite useful at times. It's not something that I use a lot, but it's still a good feature. And then one of my favorites, I absolutely love this. It is the Windows key and the arrows. This is also called docking, but you can do some really fun stuff with it. So let me bring up my coffee bar. And let's say I only want this to take up half of my screen. So I'm gonna hold down the Windows key and I'm gonna keep holding it um, for pretty much this whole time. So I'm gonna tap it, this to the left and that has docked that window to the left. I'm gonna tap down and it has shrunk the window a little bit. It's actually given it uh, a quarter of the screen. Now I'm gonna keep it at that size. I'm gonna open up something else here. And I want this one docked to the right. So I'm gonna hold down my Windows key and tap the right arrow. Now I've got it docked to the right, but maybe I don't want it 
the full side of the right. So I'm gonna tap down to give it that quarter view, but I kind of want it up a little bit. So I'm gonna tap up instead, and that's gonna bring it up to the quarter of the screen. So now I've got um, two screens that are a quarter of my screen each. And if I wanted to maximize one of them, let's go back to the coffee bar. I'm gonna hold down the Windows key and tap up. And then I'm gonna tap up again one more time. And now it's full screen. So I can sit here all day and play around with these and just move them around the screen. And it's kind of a fun little jaunt. And then we get into the keyboard shortcuts that I use all of the time. I can't tell you how often I use these. They are so useful to me, especially the first one, Alt-Tab. Now, if your thumb is still on the keyboard over by the Windows key, you can slide it over to your Alt key, and here's where that Tab key comes into play. And I'm going to hold down the Alt key, and I'm going to tap Tab, but I'm going to keep holding down Alt. And this brings up a view of all of the items that I have open. And if I keep holding down the Alt key and tab through, it actually highlights the different things that I've open. And when I land on the one that I want, I just let go and it brings that window up. Now, if you're a little bit more uh, dexterous, you can also take your ring finger this one on your left hand, while you're holding down the Alt key, hold down the Shift key with the ring finger and tap the Tab key with your middle finger. And that cycles the opposite way because Shift usually means go the opposite way. So I can flip through all these programs back and forth and I can go up to the lobby. I can switch over to the coffee bar. I can go back to my spreadsheet and I can go to my Word doc and go back to the coffee bar and I can seriously slip, flip through everything over and over again, again, hours on end. It's really fun. Alt tab is my favorite. Now after Alt tab, I've got Alt F4 because this one is really important with systems that are a little older, a little bit slower, something might be freezing up on you, or maybe you're just done. You're, you're working on your document and you are done. You don't want to see it anymore. You want to close it out. If we hold down the Alt key and tap F4 on the keyboard, that actually closes the program. So don't do that on your Zoom right now. <laughs> um, but it, if you've got a bunch of things open and you want to go through and you want to close some of them and keep some open, Alt-Tab to find the one that you want to close, and then Alt-F4 to close it. Now, again, it doesn't always work um, with, with every program, but for the most part, it's a good, a good option. Another really great shortcut is the F5 key. This is a refresh key. This works on web browsers. So if you're putting something into a web browser form and you wanna refresh the page, or you're looking at that coffee counter and you wanna refresh it and see how many more drinks people have listed on there, F5 is a really great refresher. I use it with my Windows Explorer program, um, which is down here. Mm, the system that I'm in, um, typically has some issues with refreshing. So if I'm moving pictures around, it doesn't always show what I'm doing right away. And I just have to refresh it with, Alt with F5 um, and, and whatever I've moved or whatever I've copied will show up again. Um, so F5 for refreshing, it's awesome. Now F11 will expand most programs to full screen. This again has some issues with some older programs. Uh, sometimes like when you're running a PowerPoint presentation, it doesn't like to work quite right. But if you've got a smaller window open and you just, you wanna see it full screen, F11 is a really good option. And then the last one is Control-Alt-Delete. Now, I know that a lot of you 
can remember control alt delete from back in the day when you did that and it would just restart your computer. Well, a little while ago, Windows changed things and now there's actually more options. So that Windows L for lock, you can actually do that through uh, control alt delete. Um, you can switch users, you can sign out of your computer and you can change your password from that screen as well. And then one of the more important features is you can get to your task manager. And that's what I use control alt delete for is to get to my task manager. That shows me what apps I'm running. If any of them are freezing or giving me problems, I can um, end them here and close them out. You can also see how many tabs I have open with a browser um, or just how many parts of that browser are running. Uh, Firefox and Chrome have multiple instances that run at the same time when you open up a browser, so you can see that. You can also see that I've got 134 background processes. And a lot of those are just running in the background, uh, things that kind of need to be going and um, just let them run. And then a variety of services. And Task Manager also shows me how my computer is doing. So if I wanna see how much I'm taxing my CPU, how much memory I'm using, things like that, Task Manager is really good for that as well. And I get there by going to Control Alt Delete. The last few shortcut keys I wanted to mention are more for documents. So when you're working in Word or Excel, sometimes these will work in other programs like Notepad, um, but they're really helpful. And again, you're going to kind of keep your hand in that corner of the keyboard to do these, uh, doc these um, shortcuts. Um, control Z is one of my favorites. I make mistakes all the time um, and I can easily move back and forth between those changes with Control Z and Control Y. Control A works really well if I'm in Excel or, um, or portions of Word that I wanna grab a whole bunch and move it over somewhere. And then Control C, Control X and Control V are my cut, copy and paste options. And again, it's one of those things where you're in Word and you want to move everything from one spot to another. You do Control A for select all, Control C for copy, Control V for paste. And you've copied everything without ever touching your mouse. It's really kind of neat. There's a lot more keyboard shortcuts out there. So if you've got a task that you want to do, say, moving between tabs in a web browser um, or moving between worksheets in Excel, there's most likely a shortcut key for that that you can Google and, and you'll find the whole list of all the shortcuts that you can use. But I typically like to use mostly keyboard shortcuts and then go to the mouse if I have to. It is possible to operate your Windows machine with just a keyboard. That is a possibility. I've only had to do that once <laughs> and for a very short time. <laughs> so one of the things that you want to check when you first get a computer, either through work or through home, or even now that you're learning about this, is your computer settings. And that's when you tap the start menu and you get the typical start menu and taskbar. Now, I'm a minimalist with my key with my computer. So when I tap my start menu, I actually hid everything. So it doesn't look like the screenshot anymore, but that's just the way I operate. Um, at the bottom, you'll notice your taskbar, and that shows all the various programs that you have. There's a lot of neat functionality with your taskbar. You can um, pin things to it. So I've got key pass open and I want that to stay there. So I'm actually gonna pin that to my taskbar. And now if I close it, it's still gonna stay there. That icon is still going to stay there and I will have it there forever. And I can just go down there and tap it open and that program will start. But let's say I got sick of it and I don't want that there anymore. I can just right click on it and unpin it from taskbar and it goes away. 
Now, if there's a program in here that I don't have pinned, but I want pinned, I can find it in my all apps list and I can go here and just double click it and drag it down to my taskbar until it says link and let go. And now it's pinned to my taskbar. The other thing that you can do is if you click on it and it's open, you can also right click on any open window and pin it or unpin it from your taskbar. Um, let me get this closed. Okay. Now, when you tap on your Windows key, you will notice in the bottom left corner a little gear icon. And this is your settings menu. And now this is really important with starting with Windows 10, I would say, is to go into your settings. And there are certain settings you really, really, really should look at. And that's going to be your update and security, your apps, Cortana, and your privacy settings. With updates and security and privacy, Windows defaulted a whole mess of settings that automatically send your data to Windows, or um, they look for certain things or they notify certain things and it's just not not cool in my opinion <laughs> so you'll want to go through these settings they're very easy to change and to read through and to understand there are help files if there's something you don't understand but i would suggest going through those four sections and really checking to make sure you've got what you want on there and that's mostly for update and security as well as privacy with apps, you want to go onto your apps, and there are going to be apps that are um, defaulted, are, are installed by default that you might not want, you might not use. They're just taking up space, and you want to get rid of them. So go through and uninstall some of those apps. Um, check on some apps that are set to run at startup. You might want that, you might not, but this is where you're going to change that. And then Cortana. So Cortana is kind of like Alexa with Amazon. Cortana is a, a voice program. You can speak to Windows and ask it what you want. I'm a big privacy person and have a feeling that a lot of that information, a lot of the voice controls are being sent somewhere. So I'm really paranoid about that. And I turn Cortana off. I recently found out that in the educational edition, of Windows, which is what I have on my laptop here, Cortana is not listed in the settings, so you won't necessarily see it. However, it is listed in my apps. So it is installed, it's just turned off for the educational one. So regardless of which version you have, you're gonna wanna try to check your settings for Cortana and probably turn it off if you're not too thrilled about it. So on we go to web browsers. Now we all use these every day, but not many people know what they are. And they're simply a translator. And like Professor Schwartzman here, I've always wanted, wondered what dogs were actually thinking. And it would be pretty funny to me if they were just saying, hey, because that would be hilarious. Um, but I think they're saying a little bit more than that. Um, with web browsers, it takes code that you see on the left and this is only 58 lines of code it's more like a, a thousand or so for a website but a web browser takes that code and translates it into a web page so it actually becomes what you're seeing here and this is actually the beginning of the code for the main website for uw uh, we wouldn't necessarily want to be presenting code to the rest of the world because it doesn't make much sense to most of us, but the website actually does. However, website web browsers are not perfect, just like human translators. I wish I was live right now because we would all be laughing together. So I hope you guys are laughing because I thought that was funny. I saw some pretty crazy ones in Thailand. They, they try hard. 
So the main two web browsers that most people use are going to be Firefox and Chrome. Now, Firefox and Chrome have become very, very similar. With both options, you can log in and sync your information so that you've got your bookmarks saved. You can go to another computer, log into Firefox over there, and you've got your bookmarks. They're not necessarily being stored locally. There's themes and add-ons and ways to make yourself more productive and ways to make to give you uh, time wasters and you can make things pretty or ugly and you can really screw things up or really make it smooth. Uh, there's a lot you can do with Firefox and Chrome. So it's a toss up which one is better. However, I think we can all agree that Internet Explorer and, Ed, and Edge is the new one um, are not ideal to use. <laughs> There's a lot of um, a lot of extra stuff in there, a lot more um, time to, to get things the way you want it. The menus are uh, not very easy to use. There's a cookie tracking up the wazoo. They're not great. But I do use Internet Explorer when someone else is going to be logging into a WISC site on my laptop. Uh, because I don't use Internet Explorer for my personal things, there are no cookies with my username on them. So somebody else could log in and very easily get logged in and we can do what we need to do. So I keep Internet Explorer, but I really only use it if, if I'm trying to do something that I don't normally do. Safari is the web browser that actually is on Mac computers. There was a Windows version for a little while, and there still might be some third-party Windows versions, but Safari really is the main web browser for Macs, and it's really not very nice to use on a Windows machine. And then Opera is actually an open source web browser. Uh, back in 2016, it was purchased by a Chinese conglomerate, and there were some problems with their stuff being hacked and they've come out with new versions. And it's something that some folks out in the IT world know, use, very few people really like it. It's there, it's an option. You might check it out and you might enjoy it, but it's opera. <laughs> And now I want to show you some things that are actually installed on a Windows machine by default that you might not know about. Can I interrupt just a second, Robin? Yeah, go for okay. it. It is almost 1.15 and there are some sessions that start at 1.15 and I, wa I wanted to warn people oh, sure. if they wanted to jump over that they could take this opportunity to jump over to one of those. There's the a Flash Talks and then a SharePoint and MS Teams session going on. So awesome. need to hop off, please do. If not, uh, Robin, keep going. All right. Uh, first off, we have the snipping tool, which is a uh, screen grabber. And as you can see, it's moving and it has a new feature called snip and sketch, which I tried and it's not working quite right, but it's there and it's on your machine. There's also the standard paint, but there's also now paint 3D, which has a bunch of different 3D templates and it's really a lot of fun to play around with. Uh, the alarms and clocks features has extra stuff in it, um, timers, you can set a multitude of alarms, and it even has a world clock where you can set up a whole bunch of uh, clocks depending on what places you're interested in. We've got a lot of people traveling this year, so it's nice to know what time it is where they are. And then you all know and hopefully love the calculator, but did you know that it's not just a standard calculator? There's even a data or date calculation. So if you need to check on that 90 days for your e-reimbursement or another date, um, you can do that. And then there's a bunch of converters as well within the calculator. And last but not, oh, nope, this one more. <laughs> We've got common-ish software. And this is more for the UW. We've got our virtual private network, Global Protect. Uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, and Box. And these show up in the menu system that are in the bottom right corner of your screen. There's a little up arrow that will show you a bunch of programs that are running 
currently. And these three are set to start at startup. Um, so they turn on, log in, and you're all good. With Box, it looks like my box is empty, but I haven't typed anything in there. As soon as I start, type, start typing a file or folder name, it'll show everything that's in there. But this way, I don't have to go to Box and log in and then see everything. It's already installed and logged on. And then last but not least, I wanted to show you portable apps. These are not Windows, uh, Windows programs. These are separate programs altogether. Portable apps is like a portable operating system that you can put onto a flash drive, and then you can install programs right inside portable apps on that flash drive, and then you can keep those programs with you wherever you go. Uh, the ones on the screen here are some of my favorite. GIMP is a free, ver oh, and all of these are free, by the way. Uh, GIMP is a free version of something like Photoshop. KeyPass is a password manager. LightScreen is a Windows snipping tool that I think is a little bit more powerful than the window than the one that's installed on Windows. Notepad++ is a more powerful Notepad program, and PicPic is a really wonderful color picker. So some of my favorite programs are free and not Windows programs, um, and you can get them all from portableapps.com. So check that out when you have some time. And that is at the end. So thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions, please let us know either in the chat or feel free to unmute. If you saw anything in the presentation that you'd like more information on, you'd like a full workshop on one or one thing or another, feel free to put it in the chat or submit a feedback form. And thank you for coming. I'm curious as to how many people went, what? I didn't know that was there <laughs> throughout this whole thing. I did, I know, but certainly on the calculator. There's a converter in there, what? Yeah, and it's Graphic pretty calculator. accurate. <laughs> I used the, the date calculation a lot for, um, for e reimbursements. That 90 day window scares me. <laughs> mm, I understand. Uh, cool. Um, yeah. The five star chemical zone, I always think about that one day. Hey, hey, whenever my dog is barking. <laughs> Especially at another dog. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I wonder, oh when my was that gosh. published? That we are all been thinking. It's all in our brains for 10 oh, years. Oh, yeah. 20 yeah. years. Time is good. It's, it, yeah. I think it was old when I was young. <laughs> I was probably old when you were young, too. But that's, <laughs> that's beside the point. Anyway. Uh, folks don't have any questions. We'll wrap it up because we're a little bit over time. And I don't want to hold back people from other sessions. So, um Remember to put your coffee and your water and your caffeine intake into our coffee counter just because it's we have fun with that and we'll report out on it next year and say, Oh, we drank this much coffee. Yes, <laughs> so everybody can take that as a channel ch challenge. So, uh, we have uh, we have sessions that just started at 1 15, they were on my screen a second ago, and uh, so uh, flash talks session one at 1 15 to 1 45 and at the same time, SharePoint and MS Teams, a collaborative technology. And then right after, and then at two o'clock, we have understanding impact versus effort and how to maximize throughput, your team's throughput, as well as using contract first API development to design for user needs, which I will be moder moderating as well because I was going to be there anyway. So <laughs> thank you, Amanda. Thank you, yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. And there'll be a recording with live with uh, professional captioning available in the coming weeks. Thank you. Great.